What's up everyone, it's Endymion, and my goodness do I have a lot to cover today. From Helldivers 2's battle against real-world symbolism and the game getting even more nuclear, another consulting group threatening to put people on lists and ban them from the industry, a veteran lawyer admitting that the game's industry has been actively working to remove anyone who doesn't agree with wokeness, and even some stupid Resident Evil 5 nonsense as well. It's a lot, I know, so let's start with Helldivers 2 first. From thatparkplace.com we have this article titled, LGBTQ plus activists accuse Helldivers 2 developers of silencing them after they attempted to push propaganda into game. I've reported previously already on how the entire Helldivers 2 situation is kind of the current battleground for woke identity politics. In case you don't know, I'll catch you up to speed quickly. Basically, Helldivers 2 is set in its own universe where the entire Earth is united, so there are no flags of America or any other country within the game. The only flag that represents humanity is that of Super Earth, because like I said, they're all united. Anyway, a ton of players are demanding that Helldivers 2 adds real-world symbols to the game like rainbow flags or even transgender capes. And of course, the players who have accepted that Helldivers 2 is its own universe are pushing back. And essentially, people want Helldivers 2 to stay a pure experience without any real-world symbols or anything that would separate players into different groups. The devs agree as well and want to keep the game the same for anyone, and since Helldivers is all about cooperation and unity, implementing symbols that could divide people kind of goes against that whole concept. So naturally, everything has gone nuclear, and it's basically, like I said, turning Helldivers into a battleground of ideologies both in-game and on the internet. One user even said this. Just got kicked out of the Discord for Helldivers 2 over LGBT comments, so someone started posting all the dirt on the LGBT stance of the devs. And I got kicked out because I questioned why this group of people need their flag everywhere and why should they get a flag put on as caves when nobody else will. The moment I posted that shortly after I was kicked out of the Discord, not gonna lie, this censorship and lack of democracy is getting old. Edit, the point I had tried to make as I have on Reddit is that if you give the cape to them, you must give it to everyone or nobody at all. Fair is fair. If I'm made to put up with seeing it, at least be fair to the other groups of people that are underrepresented. Either way, I'm sick of politics of the left and everything. Just leave me alone and let me play my game and tune out from the world crap. I agree with this user where they say just leave me alone, let me play my game and tune out from the real world because they're right when they say that, and it's really the heart of this argument across the board. Too many games inject politics, symbols, or whatever else pretty much all the time. And besides video games, you can't watch a commercial on TV or whatever else without some level of symbolism being pushed in your face. Helldivers 2 is the rare Western-made product where it hasn't bent the knee to these social norms. And that's likely a big reason why it's so popular, because you get to actually play a video game and not be beaten over the head with all the stuff you constantly see in real life. And whether people want to admit it or not, video games are escapism, and they should not be used to push real-world ideological concepts onto players or berate them if they reject them. Of course, someone will say, well, you can't not have politics in games or even things like religion, but there's a difference. A video game can have religious themes or political themes, but they should not be a one-to-one -one real life example. If you have a fictional religion within your game, like say Final Fantasy X, it's fine, because the actual religion in Final Fantasy X isn't a real world religion. But it is a fictional one that has inspirations from multiple real world religions, but if that religious group within Final Fantasy X, for the sake of argument, was straight up just called Christianity or the Muslim religion, then yeah, that would be a step too far. And the same applies to Helldivers, such the game is political satire with the whole meta argument of are we the bad guys and all that, but it doesn't outright put stuff like American flags or rainbow capes or anything. And I think the reason why the players that do want that stuff in Helldivers so badly is because they're used to getting their way with pretty much every single other game that's made in the West. And the fact that this one in particular refuses to bend to their whims like the others, well now it's a problem. As one user on the Steam forum said, I guess Super Earth doesn't care about the sexual orientation of Helldivers and sends them all to the front line. That's pretty fair in fact. And yeah, that's pretty much the point here. You're not a special hero of the cause or the chosen one in Helldivers world. You're a grunt. You're just meat for the grinder. You're like Carmine in Gears of War basically. No one gets special treatment because in the eyes of Super Earth, none of you are special. You're just as expendable as everyone else. This other user gets the point where they say, Honestly, I stand with the anti-LGBT flag people. I'm gay, but I don't need to parade that stuff. In a game based on freedom and liberty for Super Earth, we should band together, not split into separate groups. 
That's the beauty of not knowing the countries, makes us all equal, not that we aren't, but prejudice cannot be made on zero basis. Finally, someone with an actual brain between their eyes who understands and has actual normal opinions. And what this user says here kind of just drives a stake deep into this conversation and completes it by saying, Why there's no flag. Narrative coherence, audience considerations, political social controversy, break of immersion. The last point resonates me with the most. We're not in our universe. We play games to escape reality. I don't want to see any flag symbols from the real world. And that's really it. These people can't accept that their symbols and preferences are not allowed when everything caters to them outside of it already. This leads me to the next story, which perfectly encapsulates the whole Helldivers 2 situation, and how other companies work to bend the knee as much as possible, also from that partplace.com we have this titled, Former Bungie and the Pokemon Company lawyer defends Sweet Baby Inc. says his job was to get rid of anti-woke gamers. This story revolves around Don McGowan, and please don't harass this person if they are pretty volatile with their wording, I must remind you all that we must never stoop to their level. So let's just dismantle what they say with logic and facts and keep winning. Anyway, Don here openly admits that his job for years now has been working with companies like Bungie and Nintendo apparently to, in his own words, not make games for those kinds of gamers. So what he means is that game companies, mostly of the West of course, have allegedly in his words been working tirelessly to create experiences that reject the general audience. And they only want players who accept their messaging and ideologies instead. So, remember that Kotaku article that blew up about Sweet Baby? Okay, well, Don quote retweeted the author of that Kotaku article, and he had a lot to say, and I quote, I am Don McGowan, I spent 12 years as the Chief Legal Officer of Pokemon, and am now the General Counsel of Bungie. 20 years in games, 17 in the C-suite, so I'm well situated to say these people blaming one consultancy for everything they don't like, are again demonstrating they know nothing about the subject they purport to be discussing. They are sexist and racist. And it never occurs to them that the reason nobody made games for them was because nobody wanted to make those kinds of games. Nobody wants your money because no one wants you in their environment. Take it from someone most of whose job was figuring out ways to get rid of you. Trust and safety departments exist to get assholes out of the gaming environment. You end up creating them to get rid of assholes because adult humans don't want to spend their leisure time with assholes. You're a gamer gator, F off you goddamn child. Nobody wants your money, go spend it on anime porn, end quote. Don obviously feels like he has a gotcha against players, but really all he did was confirm that these consulting groups and the people who defend them openly, that they hate the paying customer. And like always, they actually believe that by making products for their modern audience they so desperately hope exists will somehow work out. Not to mention, Don admits that he's currently working at Bungie, who is of course the makers of Destiny. And that game has been bleeding players and lost tons of staff because the game has been languishing in the profitability market for a long time now. Don apparently works as the head of consulting and counsel for Bungie, and honestly, I believe him. Because if a game that is doing as poorly as it's doing right now is being spearheaded by a guy like this who said in his own words that he and others work to find ways to get rid of you as in the players themselves, I mean, his work speaks for itself. We can go back to November 2023 where we had articles like this from ComingSoon.net that reported that Destiny 2 had its lowest player counts in its entire existence as they say here. According to Steam charts, Destiny 2 averaged 34,000 concurrent players over the last 30 days. That's the lowest since the game arrived on Steam in 2019. The game's monthly peak player numbers were also the worst it's ever been with only 59,000. Currently on Steam, Destiny 2 is averaging in the mid-40,000s, which still isn't amazing, but I guess it's a little better than it was back in November 2023. But the game still, when those layoffs at Bungie happened, were apparently because according to this article from Push Square back in October 2023, that Destiny 2 had missed its projected revenue goal by 45%, and that resulted in 100 people being laid off as well. So Don can act all high and mighty all he wants, but the company he works for is clearly struggling. And clearly his counsel and consulting as he likes to be so proud of, well, it doesn't seem to be working very well. As he said himself, nobody wants your money. Well, telling your entire customer base to screw off like this is definitely one way to ensure nobody buys anything you work on ever again. I just can't believe we reached a point where these morons are actively outing themselves like this. By the way, this entire thread Don posted, yeah, he deleted it, of course. But the internet never forgets, and now we know for the rest of time that Don not only protects places like Sweet Baby Inc., but admits his job in counseling is to reject the paying customer in hopes of luring in the modern audience, which I will say again, does not exist. 
There is only the audience that has always been there. There is not millions of blue-haired people with lots of money willing to spend on Destiny 2 or whatever else. Most woke lunatics believe in communism and believe going $100,000 in debt for an arts degree is a good financial move in their eyes. These are not the sorts of people you should be catering to. They don't have money to begin with. They all think everything should be free and their needs should be covered by the government so they can focus on their art or whatever. Not realizing that if they lived in a communist society, they'd be in the mines working 13-hour shifts for a slice of bread and a glass of water. But hey, if that's the audience you want, then go ahead. I'll keep my wallet close to you, Don. After all, you're working to get rid of people like me. It does make me sad because Destiny 2 is a fun game to play and Bungie should probably apologize for having one of their employees being an idiot like this, but he isn't the only one going out of their way to attack fans and critics of Sweet Baby and others. There's this other story also from thatparkplace.com, geez, three articles in a row, they're killing it, and it's titled, Game Developer Consultant Richie DeWitt Promises to Destroy Careers of Video Game Company Employees If They Call Out DEI Policies. Yeah, you heard that right, we got another apologizer attempting to strongarm the industry with blackmail and scare tactics. So who's this person, and what's going on here exactly? Well, firstly, again, because I have to remind people, don't harass this individual. They already believe Sweet Baby Inc. is doing the Lord's work to begin with, so they are already dealing with some demons in their head. But anyway, this person is Richie DeWitt, who operates his own Sweet Baby-like consulting group called Bare Knuckle. If you go on the website for this, it advertises itself by saying, Bare Knuckle is a boutique game business consultancy founded by Richie DeWitt that focuses on hyping up independent developers and their games. So Bare Knuckle is basically a smaller version of Sweet Baby Inc. is what I'm gathering from this. Bare Knuckle has apparently consulted on some indie games with these companies being advertised as having worked with Bare Knuckle in the past. Frankly, based on these companies and the games they've worked on, I haven't really played most of them, but apparently Bare Knuckle is working with this one audio company that has worked on stuff like The Stanley Parable and What Remains of Edith Finch, to name a few. Anyway, what did this Richie guy say exactly? Well, let's look into that now. So Richie decided to virtue signal as they always do, and then Mark Kern, or you may know him as Grums, who seems to show up in my videos quite often, which is totally cool with me because he's doing good work. Anyway, Grums retweeted what Richie said, which is why this was brought to our attention. Here's what Richie said via Twitter, and I quote, I've been seeing more and more hateful Gamergate-esque opinions. I want to be clear on where I stand. I won't tolerate any harassment, violence, or threats towards devs, minorities, and women in our industry in any space that I own or have control over. I don't care about your opinions and won't go into discussions with you. I'm not interested in explaining to you how little you know of the workings of our industry and I will report and block your account. And if by any chance you happen to be working in this industry and you are voicing said opinions, I will screenshot you, put you on a person list, and advocate that you'll never work at a company I work for or associated with." End quote. Well, that's one way to really drive your point home, isn't it? So Richie Boy here stands with Sweet Baby, doesn't want to discuss or hear any opinions that go against his own, and will put you on a list like a good officer and make sure you're blacklisted and excommunicated from the games industry. By the way, Richie, if you're watching this, you can put me on that list. It's a capital E on Endymion. By the way, thank you. Make sure you get a good picture of me too while you're at it. Maybe use my Twitter profile picture. I like that one of me personally. Anyway, Richie is yet another Sweet Baby-like bootlicker who does similar work to what they do and like Sweet Baby, he advocates for the use of intimidation tactics and blacklisting in order to ensure his way is always enforced. If anything about this gaming industry nonsense, it has at least proven to me that video games right now in the West anyway is just one giant club. And if you aren't politically and socially aligned 100%, you're kicked out, and I think that's lame. It's ironic that for an industry that apparently champions diversity of thought and opinions, that if you actually have any thoughts or opinions that are different than what's accepted, you don't just lose your job, but your entire career as well. Tell me how these people are not hypocrites themselves. Oh, you can have your own opinions, as long as they perfectly align 100% with everything we all believe and say. Also, if that's not the case, then you can go die. Very cool. If I was a young fledgling developer that was looking to work in the industry and all that stuff, I'd become so disillusioned and jaded because it's so evidently clear that you either have to drink the Kool-Aid and become an NPC or just lie about everything you are and work every day, masking yourself from your beliefs and opinions to ensure you don't get thrown into the garbage. 
It's just such a pathetic way to live. Of course, I'm likely blacklisted a hundred times over and I'm fine with that personally. Because someone has to say these things out loud because we know journalists won't because they're in bed with these companies too. But there was more to what Grum said when it came to ESG and how these things come to be. Which I think is important to understand, so here's another clip from the quartering that I think needs to be viewed, so here, listen. Well, it's, it's, it's not just money. Like you pointed out, different regions will offer tax credits. And these things come with strings attached, all right? Right. Uh, political strings attached. And one thing that, you know, uh, everyone needs to realize is that it's not that these studios are funding the games out of their own pocket. That would be very expensive for them. Cash is king. They will preferably go out and get money from other sources if it's cheap enough to help spread the risk of these massive titles. And so you have a lot of quid pro quo happening. And I can tell you that um, devs have been approaching me and giving me some inside baseball and what's been happening. And there are deals, funding deals out there for studios, and I can't get too specific, I don't want to uh, out my sources, that have certain strings attached. Like a company will suddenly sign with a developer, and now that developer uh, needs to hire a DEI director and needs to uh, go out and hire consultancy firms to uh, gender balance their uh, staff or... Uh, <laughs> quite specifically, go out and hire companies like SBI to consult on their writing and do sensitivity reading and changes for that. And what does all this do? It boosts their ESG score. It allows them access to that funding. So ESG is not going away entirely. It's become an evil brand. People are w waking up to this. Hey, even so you CD have Project a Red, man. Even CD yeah. Project Red does it. So you have, you have a rebranding going on right now. They're not calling it ESG, but it's still out there. And the money isn't as cheap as it was before because interest rates are up everywhere, but it's still out there and it's still fine. This is why you look at how, how could a studio agree to do this? How could they do something that's so financially devastating to their games? And it's because they're kind of in this situation where that's the money they can get. And so, you know, you have this self-perpetuating machine and I don't think, and that's why it's kind of a death spiral that I don't think you can really escape. The only way you can escape it is to make a good game. And if you're already reliant on ESG and you're already reliant on these other fundings because your games are too damn expensive to make, you're trapped. And as Grum says it here, this ESG nonsense and all this diversity equity index or DEI stuff, it's just trapping these companies. They are being strangled by the very deals they're making and it's causing long-term diminishing returns and it's ruining these properties and franchises. And if you speak out against it, people like Richie DeWitt will ensure that you never work in the industry again. Because going against it is not good and it's all part of the plan, so to speak. This is why you see so much virtue signaling in games media all the time, like recently IGN apparently had this to say about Resident Evil 5 being remade which was just so stupid, but proves my point sadly. IGN pushes the idea that Resi 5 can't be remade as it once was, and instead it must be completely rewritten if it's going to get the same treatment as previous remakes. I figure we hear what they have to say because it's ridiculous, and I quote, With Resident Evil 4's release last year, Capcom's project to remake the glory years of a survival horror series is complete, but as the game's post credit scene suggests, the remakes aren't over. And so the big question is, where next? The obvious answer is a remake of Resident Evil 5. But on the game's 15th anniversary, it's clear that moving forward chronologically will take Capcom's remake into the series' weakest era, an era of gameplay and narrative decisions that must be best left in the past. Resident Evil 5 simply can't be remade, at least not to the standards of Capcom's best work, and so the answer is not to remake, but to rewrite. With Resident Evil 4, director Shinji Mikami definitely reinvented the series through the use of a new over-the-shoulder camera angle. The perspective allowed for a more kinetic, action-heavy game. Despite this, Mikami never lost sight of the terror at the core of Resident Evil. Through use of enemies that were strategically placed to provide waves of tension and fear and the inclusion of Ashley as your vulnerable charge, combat encounters were focused on surviving overwhelming horrors rather than dominating foes. Resident Evil 5, meanwhile, presents its enemies as waves to be gunned down with increasingly powerful weaponry. Their purpose is cannon fodder, a wall of meat to slow your progress through levels. And those levels are not locations to be explored, instead they are largely funnels that push you from entrance to exit. And so you could argue that Resident Evil 5 is actually the Resident Evil most in need of a remake. 
a whole new environmental structure and scenario design that reigns in the action and dials of the horror would bring it in line with Capcom's other remakes. But all of this doesn't account for Resident Evil 5's most notorious problem, racism. Set in the fictional West African country, Resident Evil 5's primary antagonists are black people. Yes, technically it's the Ouroboros virus that protagonist Chris Redfield is fighting, but the Parasite's host is depicted as a nation of mobs and primitives who are violent even before their infection. Intentionally or not, Resident Evil 5 positions Africa as the Dark Continent, an uncivilized world harboring a diseased population that needs gunning down via Western intervention in the name of global security. This insensitive treatment of people of color was hotly debated even as early as Resident Evil 5's debut trailer. The arguments and think pieces continued well into the game's release window, but that was 2009, a time when race was apparently a debate rather than a reality. In the 2020s, in a post-Black Lives Matter world, there is only one acceptable response to a white man shooting waves of Africans for an entire video game. No. Remakes may be able to redefine their source material, but there's only so many changes you can make until it's not a remake at all, but an entirely new game. And if you take Africa out of Resident Evil 5, is it even Resident Evil 5 anymore? Even with a vastly improved, more sensitive take on the continent, perhaps one with a black protagonist and more empathetic look at the outbreak, the experience would simply be too divorced from the original to hold the name Resident Evil 5, end quote. They say a lot more than this, but frankly, I think this is more than enough. I find the concept that Resi 5 needs to be rewritten or feature a black protagonist to be ridiculous. I did a whole video about Resident Evil 5 being apparently racist like almost two years ago at this point. So I'll try to not repeat myself too much here, but this entire situation is moronic and really lame. First of all, the enemies are zombies, and every single Resident Evil game has you shooting people of all colors, not because of racism or whatever, but because they're infected. They're zombies. It's funny how these journals never complain about other Resi games' environments, like in Resident Evil 4, you're just gunning down vaguely Spanish people? All over, by roundhouse kicking them, shooting their heads off, or tossing grenades into crowds of them. Yet none of that is problematic, of course, because the zombies are Spanish people, I guess. But since Resi 5 is set in Africa, which obviously has a lot of black people in it, somehow this is bad because shooting black people is racist, but shooting any other color of person isn't. Right, that makes no sense. It's just pointless pandering, and frankly, Resi 5 does not need to be rewritten in terms of its concept or setting. Nor does Chris Redfield need to be replaced by some new black character either. This whole thing is stupid to be real with you. The only fixes Resi 5 needs, in my opinion, is it needs to up the horror more and dial back the comical action angle that it starts to become in the later chapters. What I mean by this is how later on near the end you're punching boulders and calling down orbital strikes on giant kraken-like zombie appendages. Yeah, that can probably be dialed back because it's kind of dumb. Just make it more of a survival horror game and keep the horror element throughout the entire experience. But in terms of the black people zombies or whatever, I mean, dude, it's set in Africa, what do you want? And we all know if this game was about Chris shooting white people zombies, or if its main character was a black guy shooting white people zombies, these journalists would love it and praise it. And that's what I find really weird, besides the fact they're hypocrites. But that these journals almost unanimously have this self-induced inner hatred of themselves that they've become conditioned to believe. And they see Chris Redfield shooting an infected zombie, and immediately their woke progressive brains go into super damage control mode, and I think it's laughable. If Resi 5 Remake does get announced and they change the setting or anything about the game, yeah, I'm not buying it. Because I'm obviously against censorship and pandering to these morons, and I don't personally think anything is wrong with Resi 5 to begin with. Just up the horror, maybe smooth out the controls, add more exploration elements, and dial it back on the nonsense big action, which obviously is a big reason why Resi 6 is considered so awful. If they can make Resi 5 look better, even though honestly just looking at this footage on screen, damn, this game looks great, graphically anyway. Well, you know, make it look nicer, run better and all that, and we're golden. Also, it's hilarious because IGN says Resi 5 is problematic and all that, but if you look up what they scored it when it came out, they gave it a 9 out of 10. Wow, so problematic, yet you guys seem to love it when it came out. Goes to show you just how much has changed since the good old days of gaming journalism to now. They'd probably give Resi 5 a 5 or 4 out of 10 just a virtue signal, or they flat out refuse to review it at all. These sites are stupid, and these pointless virtue signals are stupid too. From these gaming consultants pushing against what they're calling Gamergate 2, Helldivers being attacked constantly, or this Resident Evil 5 nonsense, yeah, the industry is absolutely on fire right now. 
but I'll keep working to keep it accountable because we all know these modern game journalists won't, but don't worry. And that's why I exist, you can blacklist me or whatever, I will stand where I always have between the players and the bad actors who look to destroy everything we love. As always, thank you for watching, subscribe, like, and share the video, and have a wonderful day. Thanks to my patrons, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next one.